quest for truth. I'm your host, Doug Hamp. Joined with me is Rob Skiba, the co-host. We're excited to be with you again to delve into the scriptures and to take your questions. We've had a, a great time taking your questions. Thank you for very thoughtful questions, and uh, it's our pleasure to uh, answer those to the very best of our ability. So, Rob, uh, why don't we get started? Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you got a chance to watch it over again, but you know, of course I re re cleaned it up a little bit and put it back up on my channel. Wow, you know that was um, our second controversial episode. <laughs> First one being you know the whole issue of the canon, and this one questioning the entire Western Church model <laughs> uh, with, with regard to the Nicolaitans. So. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've had any other thoughts since 2013 when we did that. It was almost exactly three years ago today that we did that uh, July 30th, 2013. Uh -huh. So um, my view hasn't changed on that. I still f think the Nicolaitan model um, is fairly well represented by the modern, modern church today. Um, have you given any more thought to that? Uh, no, I don't think I've you know I don't think I've changed anything on that. Uh, I have read a very interesting book in the meantime, Pagan Christianity by George Barna, mm -hmm. and I forget his co-host his co-author's name, but um, you know there was a book I really didn't expect to come from a guy who does a lot of polls, and yet here is a man that should have a pretty good pulse on what is happening in at least America with Christianity. Uh, if you don't know, George Barna does a lot of uh, polling, and he does it for uh, a lot of these, most of it, the stuff he does is on uh, Christian um, ethics and those kind of questions. So, you know, here he's writing a book suggesting that America, the, the, you know, basically Christianity at large, especially in America, is, has a, a pagan influence. Now, I think, Rob, I think we should really be careful what we say here because, you know, <laughs> having coming out of, out of that tradition, I would never have considered myself pagan. I love Jesus with everything I had, and I, I'm thinking you're the same way. And, you know, so we're not trying to pick on anybody. We're not trying to say that we've arrived and you haven't. Um, but what, we, what we're what we discovering is that many of the traditions that we hold as being Christian are not necessarily what God is excited about. They're what man gets excited about. And, you know, this same thing happened with Israel. Israel started doing their own thing, uh, you know, thanks to Solomon, who brought in all of these foreign wives, and they brought in their foreign ways of worshiping their gods. Uh, you know, this really became a problem. And uh, what's interesting about the Nicolaitans is that Jesus says that uh, these are the churches that are practicing the ways of, uh, of Baal, and um, he was really upset about that, naturally, because they, uh, if you go back to what happened with the doctrine of Balaam, or Bilam, uh, who taught uh, Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, to commit sexual immorality. So if you remember, uh, as and I'm sure you do, but uh, with the Nicolaitans, uh, this is what God hates. So if you go back to Numbers 25, you know, Balak hires Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. He says, you know, I'd love to, but I just can't. I really would love your money, uh, but I just, I just can't. I, the words won't come out. Every time I try to curse them, a blessing comes up. And so what he does is he tells them, listen, I can't curse them. But just tell the young ladies to go in and say, this is how we sacrifice to our gods. And, um, and so, you know, basically that's what you're going to have is that you have now, you know, these, these you know, hot girls coming over. They're saying, hey, guys, guess what? You know, you should come check out how we worship our god. You're going to like it. Trust me, right? And, and so from there, um, you know, they start to fall into these sins, and then God is the, I mean, the, the, God's own law is the very thing that curses them. And I think that's so important nowadays because, you know, people are, you know, you can talk about pretty much, you know, any topic, pre-trib, rapture, whatever you want to talk about, that's uh, borderline okay, but if you talk about the law, oh my goodness, people just automatically think that you have uh, fallen from grace. And, you know, what's funny though, or I guess sad, is that when you break the things that God said not to break, a curse will fall on you naturally. And 
I think that's what people are forgetting is that there is a curse that is involved and it's really simple if you put your hand in the fire guess what it gets burned I would call that a curse I don't think that's a blessing I've never considered a burned hand to be a blessing and that's what people are forgetting I believe when it comes to the question of what about the law so anyway the, the Nicolaitans they're somehow using uh, you know if we if we break down that word uh, it seems to be victory over the people the Nike Laos and that seems to be what is happening and of course what, we, what they were doing is they were committing the same sin as uh, the stumbling block that, that Balak put in front of the children of Israel yeah I'm gonna put something up here on the screen you mentioned George Barna's uh, pagan Christianity and I was reading that back when I did my book Babylon Rising and this was a quote that I took from that book. Uh, if you spend time searching God's word for most of the common practices in conventional churches, you will rarely find them. If you go further and spend time tracing the history of these practices, you will soon discover that most of our religious habits are man-made choices. In fact, you're li likely to discern a pattern about the way we, quote-unquote, do church these days. If we do it, it's probably not in the Bible as one of the practices of the early church. Does it surprise you that most of what we do in religious circles has no precedent in Scripture? This includes many of the activities within church services, the education and ordination of clergy, the routines commonly used in youth ministry, the methods of raising funds for ministry, the ways in which music is used in churches, even the presence and nature of church buildings, new perspectives and practices that churches have held onto for many years. That's a pretty hardcore statement right there uh, regarding the Western church, but the point that we were making in that episode was, yes, breaking down the word Nicolaitan, lording over the people, is essentially it's this model where one guy's talking and everybody else is listening, and nobody else has really any input in the conversation and you can't just raise your hand in church you know in a typical church service and say yeah pastor you know I'm not sure that's what that's talking about right there you know could it be this or what you'll be politely or maybe not so politely escorted out of the church if you do that um, so it, and, and the vast majority of Christian churches today you know, regardless of the paganism side of things are as you said as we've said in many other episodes almost violently opposed to any mention of God's law uh, and its place in the in the church today and you know the Nicolaitans likened unto Balaam Balaam like you said was basically you know he was hired to try to curse Israel and every time he opened his mouth he's blessing them so that's not working so he says you know we find out later that he just figures out that they will destroy themselves if they just bring in some hot women <laughs> you know that will get them to do the wrong thing I mean so much so that they're having sex in the t tent of meeting and you know Pinkos has to take a javelin you know and make a shish kebab out of them mm -hmm. um, but so the Nicolaitans liken unto Balaam getting people off of God's law and by extension I would say it's it's a hyper grace me message at the expense of the law where yeah we got grace woohoo you know we 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 can do anything now you know including our own old pagan practices and christianizing paganism you know how many debates do we get into on facebook every christmas and easter <laughs> where everybody's all about you know we can christianize paganism well that's all a nicolaitan model and what struck me when we were talking about this in, in that particular episode is the word used for hate is a very strong word uh, there where it says that Jesus hates them. And man, I mean, that, that broke my heart because, yes, while I was in that paradigm, I loved Jesus. I loved the Lord with all my heart and was serving him regularly. In fact, I would write, direct, produce, and play Jesus in passion plays on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I mean, I was hardcore into that system, thought that I was serving, not realizing that the, the one sign, he gave to the Pharisees, they said, you know, prove that you're the Messiah. He says, okay, I'll give you a sign, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the heart of the earth for three days and three, or in the heart of the, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Well, you can't get 72 hours, three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. So here I am thinking I'm doing this amazing stuff while I was actually portraying and denying the one sign that would prove that he's the Messiah. Because I was in the paganizing or Christianizing paganism Good Friday to, to Easter Sunday paradigm and in an environment that that taught grace at the expense of the law mm -hmm. and and I'd bring people back to Paul everybody wants to use Paul well I mean just go read Romans 6 
you know, should we sin because, you know, so grace may abound? God forbid. Mm -hmm. When you take the definition of sin, which is defined for us by Scripture in, in John chapter 3, sin is transgression of the law, and Sheila actually had this idea. She said, what if we replace the word sin with the biblical definition everywhere it's used? Well, Paul talked a lot about not living in sin. So if you replace that sort of generic word sin everywhere Paul mentions it, and replace it with the biblical definition, transgression of the law, then you know that Paul was absolutely never, ever saying we should do away with the law. He was constantly saying that we should not live in transgression of the law. He was against the rabbinic traditions that added to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's well laid out for us in Galatians chapter 1, mm -hmm. uh, of all places. Yeah. Guys, before we go much further, I want to go ahead and remind people that are viewing on YouTube or if they're streaming on somewhere else, if you go to the de description there, you can come to the chat where we're actually going to be fielding questions to Doug and Rob. We uh, The f chat's filling up pretty quick. We probably, I don't know if we'll reach the limit or not, but it's looking like it's get coming close. So if you want to get your questions in, come hop over um, right now to the chat and ask your questions. I see that there's a lot of people chatting on YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, just come well, on over. Yeah, why don't we just jump in then if there's that many people asking questions. We well, there's a lot of people in the chat, but not so many people asking questions yet. But I do have a question. So you guys were talking about the seven stars in, the in, you know, I mean, this is what it opens up with this seven yeah. stars. And um, the, sh the last show you guys were talking about, that it, could it be angels? Could it be preachers? Could it be what? Um, explain that to the audience again and explain it to me. What do you guys still think about that? Well, I, I think it's pretty obvious what I think about it, but uh, Doug, I gotta say, man, you know, a lot of times when we have debates, you argue so well in favor of my point of view. <laughs> I'm like, I should just bring you over, man, and like kicking and screaming, because <laughs> in that particular episode, you were a lot more dogmatic about the idea, and so much so that we were both considering the fact, or the possibility, not the fact, but the possibility that the the star that the Magi followed may have been an angel, and as you said, well, it ser certainly solves a whole lot of, you know, int questions and problems if we just, you know, allow that to be the case. So mm -hmm. my position, you know, though I may not have been as hardcore in that episode, I was saying, yeah, Enoch says the angels are stars, you know, stars are angels. Um, now I'm much more in that camp, uh, mm -hmm. but um, if, if, I, if I was to use your argument from a couple weeks ago and contrast it to your argument three years ago, there would be a pretty significant difference. <laughs> well, I, I guess I would beg to differ. I mean, I was making the case that in the Book of Revelation, you know, the uh, the consistency consistency internally in the book is it's talking about stars being angels, and and it's defined for us. That's the that's the distinction. Um, you know, whereas again, I still see that we have stars mentioned many places in Scripture as being some kind of heavenly body that's up in the sky, as is the sun and the moon, things that we can see, we can observe, we can study, and so I don't, I don't think that it's, you know, wise to say that the entire Bible is making the case that every reference to a star is an angel. But in the book of Revelation, which is indeed highly symbolic, there's no question about that, uh, we are given many places where the term is defined for us. And so in light of that, I would argue that here angels is a or stars is a reference to angels I mean we're told point blank that the stars and angels are equivalent in the book of Revelation so there, there's no mystery about that so you know based on that that you know the question then becomes okay so what are these angels well when stars are referred to you know when stars and angels are used interchangeably then they're not just humans they're being used as uh, you know these other spiritual beings so that's why I would argue that these the angels that it's re, that, that they're writing to in uh, the seven churches is uh, not you know not just pastors of a of a uh, earthly nature but these are leaders just like we have the prince of Persia the prince of Greece etc that everyone has their their area they're their turf you know they're in charge of something and I think that's completely consistent with what Scripture teaches, is that we have these angels, the spirits that we cannot see. Uh, they, they do have authority. If we go back to Daniel chapter 4, we, taught, we hear about the watchers, and the watchers are the ones that decide 
that Nebuchadnezzar should spend seven seasons out hanging out with the animals. It's not directly from God. Uh, God, you know, certainly lets it happen, but you know, as far as we can tell, it wasn't God's specific idea, but it was something that He permitted the angels to do, and He gave His blessing to it. And so I think we also have angels that are doing all kinds of things. You know, that's what's exciting about this is that you know when you start to pull back that veil. For example, in Second Kings chapter six, there you see that Elisha and his servant were surrounded, and when he, uh, the Lord, opened the young man's eyes, and he could see as well what Elisha was seeing, is that on the mountains all around them were these horses and chariots of fire, and you know I think that's what's happening. It's just the the thing is we don't really, you know, we can't. Most of us, I mean, it's, uh, maybe some people can, but I can't. I don't see angels on a. I've never seen an angel to be honest. So. Uh, but I believe that they're there. I believe that they're around us. They're they're doing all kinds of important jobs. And it would seem to me that even these seven churches would have their angel, their messenger, that would deliver this message one way or the other. I don't know how they're going to deliver it. But it would certainly solve a problem because if John is writing a letter and he's on the island of Patmos, there's no post office, there's no internet, there's no email, you can't text it to these different churches. How are you going to get the message to these different churches, right? So uh, if this is such a vital message that they all need to get, to me it would seem that he could write these uh, letters, as it were, and then the angels would be the ones that would essentially deliver it, so to speak. So, But, you know, again, we don't have a lot. We don't have enough to go on to, to make an absolute ironclad case, but I think we can make a very strong case. You know, I think something else that was interesting in that episode, and put this up here on the screen share again, um, was we were discussing the uh, the angel at the time of uh, Yeshua's birth, possibly uh, the star, possibly being an angel. Found perspective, it looked like um, a moving star, because we do just like you've pointed out, see so many references to angels being likened unto stars that it seems to make sense. Well, you know, it's also interesting with all of the the so-called UFO activity uh, that we see. I mean, there are, right. I mean, just yeah. count, countless videos on YouTube of people uh, now video videoing with their uh, their iPhones yeah. or whatever. Right. You know, these these glowing orbs up in the sky, and and you know, it's not only some crackpot out in Texas or something. Right. Sorry, hey. Not Texas. <laughs> hey, sorry, Texas. I, I meant to say. say I meant to say Arkansas or something like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, or, or, well, actually, I meant to say California. <laughs> so I meant to say that's where the real crackpots are. Uh, no, you have the crackpots. We have the, the nuts and flakes. Right. But um, there you go. So anyway, you know, with with all of these things, so these these glowing orbs that are, you know, up there. Uh, well, they're glowing, right? And and they're orbs. They kind of look like stars. And you know, if you had just one of those, just going in a particular direction, it would look like a star for all practical purposes. Even sure. if you happen to look up and see a a satellite going around the Earth. I mean, we know that it's a satellite, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly to someone back then, they wouldn't know what that thing is. But so. Um, since then, I have been thinking, because th those UFO clips were all from my um, Mount Hermon Roswell DVD. I had it, like an eight-minute montage, and I had uh, David Stinnett on my radio show, and he's he's like, that's what he does. I mean, his whole thing is uh, UFO, you know, studying cases like that, you know, with MUFON and other organizations, and going out there and doing investigations and stuff. And on my radio show, I asked him about modern UFO sightings, and he said, yeah, Especially nowadays, it's not the nuts and bolts, flying saucer kind of thing that everybody's everybody's seeing glowing orbs, which, as you saw in the clip right there, it all looked like stars. So, yeah, I'm I'm much more of the opinion now, not only because of my research that I've done in the last year, but because of the testimony and the videos that we see over and over and over and over again of UFO sightings all over the world. They look exactly like stars and you know we are in agreement I, I I still believe that uh, you know both of us think that when we're talking about aliens and UFOs we're really talking about fallen angels and demonic activity we're not talking about visitors from you know somewhere out there uh, you know in, in space 
So if that's the case, then you know all of these UFOs that we've seen and Foo Fighters that they started seeing back in World War II, which were described exactly the same way as flying orbs, um, seems to me that those are angelic beings doing their thing, and, and they look exactly like stars. Mm -hmm. One question I would have about that whole thing is if, if it was just angels, okay, why say these are the seven stars, which are the seven angels? Why not just say these are the angels or the messengers for the seven churches? Why have to clarify that at all? Hmm. Well, I, I think because it is a very highly symbolic book, uh, symbolic, I don't mean that it's not true. I mean that there are many, many symbols. You know, when you come to a red light uh, at an intersection, it's a symbol, right? It, it generally doesn't say stop. I mean, some of them do, but most of them it's just a red light. But because you took the class and you got the decoder key that said you need to stop when you see a red light. So, in Revelation 1.20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, you know, he's seeing a vision that has symbology in it and then he's being told what each of those things would mean. Just in the same way that Jesus would give a parable, the parable of the sower. Okay, so Lord, tell us what is the parable of the sower all about? Well, okay, so the seed is the good news or the word of God, uh, the sower is the evangelist, you know, the bird is the devil, right? So there are these, these, these pictures that are very powerful because, you know, just like, you know, that was kind of like their movie, right? The parable was their, the ancient form of a movie, right? So now they have this, this picture going around in their head of this guy who's throwing seed out. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. They're like, oh, yeah, well, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, the, the sower is the evangelist. So as they're thinking about a picture, they now are told which, what each of those things mean. And here John is given a picture, which he actually sees with his own eyes in the vision. And, but then he still doesn't know what each of the symbols means. You know, so far as he can tell, it's just a symbol. Uh, take Joseph's dream, for example. You know, his father figured it out right away. So did his brothers, right? You know, were we going to bow down to you? Fat chance of that. You know, but it was given to him in a dream, in a vision, or a, a symbolic state. But each of those elements had a uh, had a definition, and so that's what we're looking at. All right. Um, and Rob, unless you have anything to say to that, I'm going to ask the first question up here from Jesse. It says, do all the stars fall from heaven? Well, we we talked about that in uh, a few episodes back. I, I'm, Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John all say yes. They do. <laughs> okay, so there you go. I guess they all fall. So, all right, well, um, what are we supposed to say to that? Um, yeah, and, and if we look at uh, Revelation 6.13, it says, And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind, and then the sky receded as a scroll, etc. So we have there, now again, as we're looking at the stars of heaven here, within the context of the book of Revelation, we've been told that these stars are angels, so that would suggest that it's we're talking about the angels. You know, if we go back to Isaiah 34, then we have, uh, it says, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falls from the vine. So, you know, this here is, um, but if, if you go back a little bit, this is really important, okay? So if we go back in Isaiah 34, uh, ver verse 1, uh, I'll start here at verse, um, verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations, and his fury against all their armies, he has utterly destroyed them, he has given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain shall be, um, sorry about that, also their slain shall be thrown with the stench, shall rise from their corpses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, etc. He says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down from Eden and on the people of my curse for judgment. 
For this, uh, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a great sacrifice, or has a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. So here, you know, it seems that he's going to have an epic battle in the heavens itself, in the in the, the the visible sky that we can see, and he's going to be fighting against these angelic beings. So take that with Isaiah, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 12, where the dragon has a tail, uh, and he's going to take down a third of the uh, stars or a third of the angels. So you know, clearly it's not the good angels; they're still they're still good to go. The sun and the moon are going to stick around, and um, you know, and so when we're looking at Matthew chapter 24, then Matthew 24 is, uh, of course, where Jesus talks about what will happen in the last day. Remember that uh, Jesus, Paul, really all of the New Testament guys, obviously Jesus is in a different category, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's taking the things that people already knew and he's now applying them. He's giving them, you know, maybe a little bit different spin or he's just reminding them. And he says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, I would... Uh, tend to think that we might want to put a, a, a colon in there or something. In other words, the tribulation of those days, what I mean by, you know, what's going to happen in those days? Well, here's what's going to happen. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So here again, he's talking about what's going to happen in that last time, that you have these, uh, you know, the things up in the heavens are going to uh, be pretty crazy. So, uh, that's that's anyway how I see that. Uh, so hope that answers your question there. All right. Um, yeah, we uh, somebody was asking, is this like a rehash of all the old? Yeah, if this is your first time listening, we're rehashing all the old Quest for Truth shows. Uh, if you go back, and I think next episode ten is the next one. So if you want to see what we're next subjects about, there's people that are wondering what the subject. Also in the description, it talks about it, so you guys can know what we're talking about next time. And we'll get to that toward the end, but I've been seeing a lot of people say something like that. So, anyways, let's go to the next question, guys. Um, it looks like George is the next question. Is there any way we can know? Oh no, I'm sorry, I, I skipped one. Um, is it the possibility that the seven stars are a reference are a reference to the planets? Uh, not in my opinion. I mean, the word planetos from Greek it just means a wandering thing. Uh, you know, something that wanders. So, um, you know, if uh, Mars is going to fall to the Earth, I think Earth would be pretty much wiped out. Same with Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, you know, if those things actually fall to planet Earth, then the whole party's over. You know, the same with, uh, you know, the stars, Betelgeuse, Alpha Centauri. You know, if those are actually to fall to the Earth, those stars, those particular stars, then, you know, we're, we're pretty much in trouble. And, um, so yeah. Anyway, the the planets. I think uh, it's it's not a reference to the planets. Yeah, I don't think it's a reference to the planets either. <laughs> All right, that was a simple one. So let's go to the next one here. Uh, this is from Jason, and he um, he says, John. He, I guess he's asking me to ask you guys. Could our understanding of the dimensions limit our understanding of angels, sort of like Flatland? You know, that's a topic a lot of people are discussing these days. Um, in fact, I just watched a YouTube video this morning my, that Sheila had on. I don't remember who it was by, but they were uh, playing clips from Chuck Missler's Holographic Universe talk and um, Gans from Face Like the Sun YouTube channel, who was talking along very similar lines. Uh, there's a lot of this dimensionality talk going on. I, I haven't studied it enough to really make much of a comment on it, uh, although to say that I'm very intrigued by it. The uh, flatland analogy is very interesting, and I think there's definitely something to it. If, there's, if there are more dimensions than, than you know, the three that we're used to here plus time as the fourth dimension, then clearly there's a lot of things we don't understand. Um, I think we are given enough to understand in the scriptures within the framework of, of this dimension. So uh, when we go into those other dimensional type things, I think we're entering seriously into uh, a realm of speculation. 
Well, I would say that we, we definitely have to have other dimensions. The fact that there are beings around us, again, 2 Kings chapter uh, 6 uh, is just a, a, what I believe is a, is a classic example. In fact, I'll just uh, bring that up for you guys so that you can uh, take a look and see that you know this is a very a very powerful passage here because uh, the servant wakes up early in the morning and they're surrounded by uh, fleshly you know people and chariots and horses uh, and uh, and then you know Elisha he's just like oh whatever he says do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them and Elisha prayed and said Lord I pray open his eyes that he may see then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha so you know from there we have I'd say very very powerful uh, evidence that there is a higher dimension and it, it obviously is existing at a, a, a different, uh, you know, it's a higher level than, than what we're used to, of course. And I think the movie Flatland does a wonderful example, of, you know, gives a, just a wonderful um, illustration. So there is a movie, if you don't want to read the book, I started reading the book, I found it a little bit tedious, but I did enjoy the movie. And uh, it really just helps you get your mind around these, these higher dimensions. There's also another guy, Rob Bryanton, who created a video called uh, imagining the ten dimensions and uh, I think he did a fantastic job and in fact you can even go on YouTube and you can put in you know uh, five dimension seven dimension twelve dimension shapes and you can see how that we can actually draw and and animate these different dimensional shapes it's really amazing so if you understand that, that we exist spatially in three dimensions and then we have a fourth dimension which we call time or what Rob Bryanton would call it uh, duration and he, he speaks of Planck time where it's like the frames of a movie right so there's 30 frames per second so just imagine each one of those is is the smallest unit of your life and you put them all together and then of course that's the sum total of your life so somebody who's at who's outside of that film if you want to go back a ways or on YouTube you just kind of do a little fast forward kind of thing right and you can see any frame you want so anybody who is outside of that dimension whether it's a YouTube video or, or the good old-fashioned film of course they can see way into the future they can see into the past uh, because they're operating or you're operating at a different dimensional uh, reality than the people that are in the film and that's essentially what we have here. And what's amazing, I found with that that movie is the Mr. A Square. You know, all he could understand was the two dimensions. And as much as he was that much higher than the f people in the first dim the first dimension, which were just dots on a line, right? Then you know he could pass through the plane of their existence. And they're like, "How did you do that?" And all they could see from him would be a single dot. Whereas he could see all the sum, the sum total of their whole world, and then of course when a sphere enters into Flatland, again he's almost like a god because he can see the whole thing at at one view, and he can see all that's happening. He can see inside their minds, as it were. And of course this is obviously fiction, but it gives you just a, a really amazing insight as to what uh, these different dimensions could be like. So I'm very much of the opinion that we have uh, higher dimensions. I think Rob Bryanton makes a great case that we have actually ten dimensions. I think uh, he makes a lot of sense of that. Obviously, we're not going to experience all ten dimensions, and I believe that God himself is that tenth dimension because the tenth dimension is both timeless and spaceless, which makes a lot of sense because uh, you know space is something that God created. Time or duration is something that God created. And God is going to exist outside of both of those because he's not created. So when he did create, uh, he made a, a space or a dimension that we could exist in. And then the, the duration that happens within that, that sphere or within that uh, space uh, that we call time, that's something that he created as well. And, 
you know, and, and how the angels fit into that exactly is not clear to us, but they would at least seem to be, you know, at maybe one dimension above us, maybe two, I don't know. I mean, we could only speculate on that, you know, ex exactly where they are, but uh, they're obviously behind some kind of a, of a veil that we cannot see them on a regular basis, and, uh, and then they can appear when they want to, but we, you know, we can't make them uh, show up, right? And uh, if you also look in Ezekiel chapter 1, you see that it says the heavens were opened. So Ezekiel could see into that realm. He could see that. When Stephen was being stoned, the heavens were opened, and he could see into that realm of, uh, of you know, what we call the, the heavenly or the spiritual realm. Uh, you know, these guys could see into that, whereas we could not. Yeah, I, I, well said. I would definitely say that our limited understanding of dimensions in our three-dimensional world would certainly limit any understanding that, of things outside of this world, just like in Flatland. I do want to show something, though, regarding time um, that you were just talking about. This is uh, my editing software. This is uh, Premiere Pro. And so what happens is when you're editing video, you have your video on a timeline here, and you also have... Uh, multiple audio timelines down here that you can add additional audio tracks to and you know infinite number of video tracks can be stacked up if you think of each of those as dimensions you know you can have all kinds of stuff going on there and you can create uh, using various um, you know things like dissolves or whatnot ways for an upper dimension to bleed into if you will or dissolve into a, a lower dimension so you can you can make them interact but what has always intrigued me as I'm editing video and as Doug said standard you know, especially uh, video on this side of the world PAL is a little different but NTSC video that we use over here is 29.97 frames per second or 30 frames per second so you know if you if if this is let's say normal life, this is at 30 frames per second. Uh, but I'm the controller here. I'm the editor. I can scroll across this timeline anywhere I want to, or I could just go boop over here, and that would be the past, or boop over here, that's the future. So I've often wondered what what is the frame rate of life? I mean, this is the frame rate of video, 30 frames per second. But I've wondered as I've spent so much time doing editing, if there might be a frame rate to our existence. What is the frame rate of, of, of life on this earth? And is it possible for you know God to be the, the video editor uh, and he can pop people in on the timeline if he wants to or dissolve people in or you know open things up so he can see the upper dimensions or, or whatnot. But you know spending as much time as I do editing, you can't help but think about things like this. In fact, I even wrote an episode of Seed uh, where I deal with the, what I call the time scrubber because that's what you call it, scrubbing the timeline when you when you do what I did with the timeline there. So I don't know that anybody's ever answered the question, this question or not before, but I do spend quite a bit of time wondering if life is has a frame rate. Because in video, it, we have the illusion of motion at 30 frames per second. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is nothing is, the only thing that's moving is the playhead. The video itself is not moving. It consists of individual still frames. So it often makes me wonder if everything's not just static, if, if everything is just, if we are, there's a frame, <laughs> there's another frame, you know, if, if we are actually, if we were to be on a, put on a timeline and whatever that frame rate is for our timeline, then are we just still frames that a playhead mm -hmm. is going across? And if that's the case, then all kinds of manipulation can take place in that timeline by whoever has the ability to scrub it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, was John, was a frame of John pulled out of, of Patmos time, timeline in about 90 AD, let's say, and transplanted over here such that uh, Ezekiel could see John measuring the temple in his timeline? You know, I don't know. I'm speculating here. The original question is, is, is whether or not our limited understanding of dimensions uh, is limiting our understanding of angels and God? Well, certainly, it would have to. You know, uh, you know, we talk about 10 or 11 dimensions of time or 10 or 11 timelines that I could stack up on the, you know, the video playhead. Yeah, who knows? I mean, there could be even more than that. But all we really understand are the three dimensions, and we can have a fair understanding of the fourth dimension time. But anything beyond that is, you know, we'd be speculating. We, we, are, we are the people in Flatland 
watching the sphere enter their world, and all it is, it starts off as a dot when the bottom of the sphere enters flatland, and then as the sphere goes into flatland, the dot in the two-dimensional world just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then gets smaller and smaller and smaller. They have no idea what just happened right there. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if, you, if we uh, kind of look at what uh, Planck uh, came up with, this is called Planck time, so, you know, what is the smallest unit according to his uh, calculations, the Planck length is the scale at which classical ideas about gravity and space-time cease to be valid and quantum effects dominate. So this is some formula, <laughs> uh, something weird, half quantum of length, uh, I don't know if there's just a missing a font or whatever, uh, the smallest measurement of length uh, with any meaning, then roughly equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 35th power, um, or about 10 to the negative 20th powers times the size of a proton. So the Planck time is the time it would take a photon traveling at the speed of light to uh, to cross a distance equal to the Planck length. And again, there's that formula. And uh, you know, so um, so basically, there's no smaller time that makes any sense. Nothing you can't really uh, go any smaller and still have it. Uh, you know, have any, any value uh, in our, our understanding. So basically, our lives are divided into gazillions of these Planck units. So if you were to kind of stop the, the film at any spot, you know, we'd all be sort of be frozen in time, right, as it were. And of course, that can't happen for us. So part of our existence is the fourth dimension. You know, it's not really accurate. Uh, even though it's popular to say we exist in three dimensions, which is partly true, but but we we don't right because you know for us to actually meet for coffee, not only do I have to give you the the physical three dimensional um, coordinates, right? I have to say okay, it's not going to be on you know 502nd you know Main Street uh, at, the, at the corner of whatever. And of course, you know, if, if, if we're in a building, let's say, I'll meet you on the second floor, right? So that's also important. So there's your three dimensions. But it really matters if it's going to be on Monday or Tuesday, right? Because I was at the right place on Monday, but you actually meant Tuesday. Then we did not meet. And, and you know, so we have to exist in four dimensions. What I find really fascinating is that the fifth dimension is all about what would happen if we made different choices. And so it's, it's, it's practically an infinite amount of choices that could be made, not only that I can make, but that you can make, and then, you know, together we make, and then, you know, what if I'd gone right instead of left back there, and what if I had, you know, lived in some other country, et cetera, what if I had, you know, gotten struck by a bus three weeks ago? I mean, all of these different possibilities are in that fifth dimension of, uh, of possibilities of what my life could be like, and when I think about the Bible, I, I was just contemplating on the fifth dimension a while ago, and I'm like, you know, the Bible could have been very different because each person in there had his own part to play, and it, the script was not written. You know, take King David for example, right? He's a great guy, but what if he just got up on the wrong side of the bed when Goliath came to town? I'm not going to go fight the guy. God would have raised up some other means to deal with Goliath. Or what if David had been faithful and had not slept with Bathsheba, right? I mean, the whole history of the Bible would be very different than what we have, but those are the choices he made, and those are the things that actually got, you know, inscribed into the Bible because those were the choices he made, and that's what I find amazing is that God is working with each one of us. You know, he's allowing these these op these different opportunities and choices to happen. And you know, this really brings up another topic, Rob, and that is the question of evil. Uh, you know, I think sometimes people they say, well, where does evil come from? As if evil is an external thing to us. Really, evil is an internal thing. Evil is simply having the capacity to make a choice that God doesn't like. And, and God is the one who claims to have created evil. And I get a lot of uh, feedback on the comments. That's not possible. God didn't create evil. Well, he didn't make you do it. That's for sure. right? But he did create the ability to make bad choices. And that's why he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden from the beginning. And if you look at Isaiah 45, 7, it says, I, the Lord, uh, 
create, I form the light and I create darkness, which is interesting. And it says, and then I, I make peace and I create evil. The Hebrew word there is ra. So it, it's the same word as the tree of the knowledge of good and ra, or evil. So God gave us the ability of free will to choose and you know so thereby he actually created the fifth dimension where we can have an infinite amount of of you know potential choices and then all of these guys you know all of us mixed together you know makes for a very interesting mix so that's at least the fifth dimension then you can look on top of that from the sixth dimension and i'm still myself a little bit fuzzy on the seventh eighth and ninth i'm not quite sure what rob ryanton is getting at i keep watching his, his video and i'm like okay i think i'm getting a little closer but uh, i'm not quite there yet but i i think i get the tenth dimension that that's basically god because it's timeless and spaceless and that's who god is so yeah i, I I love the question of dimensionality. I think it's really interesting. So fantastic. Well, we better keep going. We got so many questions here. This next one uh, goes back to the the churches and what your ideas on it. Uh, George asks, "Is there any way we can know who the seven churches are today, or who they have become?" Yeah, I think we addressed that in the episode. Um, uh, Doug and I were in agreement that those were physical churches existing in the time of John. And those were specific messages to those churches. Um, now that both Doug and I have come off of the dispensation, the church age theology uh, idea, we don't really a assign them to, well, this is the such and such age and you know the Laodicean age and the Philadelphian age and blah, blah, blah. It, that it's more along the lines, and I don't know if Doug still feels this way, but I still feel this way, that um, we ourselves as individuals can fall into the various categories that are that these churches at the time of John represent. So there have been times in my life where I'm, you know, on the right track and I'm doing the right thing and I get the attaboy, you're just like the good church here. Or there are times in my life where I've been doing some things and you have some of the situations where God's like, you know, I, I like what you did here, but I don't like what you did there. You know, and so what we were basically saying is you don't have to be locked into any of these specific church types. Yeah. It, you no, know, you can, but we do because of our choices in fifth dimension. If you want to uh, uh, look at it that way, um, find ourselves likened unto the various churches, and you know, the goal would be to find ourselves in the churches that he's well pleased with, you know, and say, hey, you know, all right, cool. So we get that well done, my good and faithful servant, instead of the, hey, you know, I kind of hate you, <laughs> uh, like some. Yeah, I, I think they're, I think they're templates, and I, I agree with that. That I think they're templates. There's seven different templates, and you can choose which template you want to be. You're you're definitely going to be one of these, right? You whatever your state is today, wherever your you know whatever your walk is with the Lord, you will fall into one of those templates, and let's hope it's a good one. But um, you know, and if it is, hallelujah, right? But that does that's no guarantee that you're going to stay in that template because every day you have to make choices, you have to make tough choices. And you're going to have to uh, decide if you're going to stay in that template or not, because you can easily drift into another template. And if you find yourself in a bad template, well, then it's time to wake up and say, my goodness, I'm in the wrong template. I don't want to be here because there's a little bit of commendation, but not nearly enough, or there's nothing but rebuke. I want to be over there with Philadelphia, man. They've got it going. You know, that's where we want to be. And, you know, again, when I used to think of, of the dispensational model and what the dispensational model is, they teach that there are seven epics or seven ages, and each one of these represents, you know, a couple hundred years over the last two thousand years. And I think that's completely bogus because it's 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 absolutely subjective. They can't even decide when these begin, when they end, and how would anybody even know, you know, to say, well, from two hundred A.D. to four hundred A.D., you know, that is the Church of uh, Philadelphia or something, or that's the church of Ephesus, you know. I mean, it's just so absolutely ludicrous to uh, to suggest that, and yet that is very standard uh, dispensational teaching, and I think that has confused a lot of people because they're thinking that, well, you know, hey, I'm glad I'm not, or that we are not part of that other church, you know, we're, we're one of the good church, we're at the good good time here. Uh, but in the last days, there's going to be this Laodicean church. We've got to watch out for that thing. You know, we might be the Laodicean church, or we might be the Philadelphia church. We might be the, F, you know, the, the Ephesus church, or the, 
um, Smyrna or something, right? We can fall into any one of those, and that's just a very stark reminder. It's an exhortation from the Lord that we want to be walking according to the ways that he walks. I mean, in, throughout these letters, he tells people to be an overcomer. Whoever's an overcomer, he will get to take from the tree of life. Right? He doesn't say, well, if you happen to be born at the right time and you get raptured, then it's all good. He doesn't say that. He says, no, there's something on you because each one of us has to make a choice. You know, and, and, and Rob, as we've talked about the, the different aspects of the law, I think this is what is so damaging about this idea that Jesus came to do away with the law uh, because, I mean, if he did away with the law, then what responsibility do I really have? You know, he, he comes and he dumps his, his, his uh, righteousness on me, like a bottle of ketchup, and so now I'm just smothered in Jesus' righteousness, and, it, and when God looks at me, it's just Teflon, all he can see is righteousness. Well, I don't know, that's not the message that I get. I mean, I see Jesus telling people, get out of here, I don't know who you are, you workers of lawlessness. And what does that mean? It means that each one of us is not predestined to that fate, but we have to make choices. And the choices that we make are going to determine where we go. So, I mean, Jesus is continually telling us that we have to be overcomers, that we have to make good choices, you know, as is the rest of the Bible. But uh, not from, I mean, you wouldn't think that listening to many modern uh, Christians and pastors, etc., so I got, well, yeah. I got a question before we end this topic. Before we go to the next question, um, you know, obviously the Church of Philadelphia, like you said, is the ideal situation to be in because they're one of the ones that has the least bit of trauma in in, in at the end. Um, what I guess you know, it's apparent that throughout history, all these churches did exist in, in history, and and I agree with you guys. It's probably a template for you know a way we want to kind of see ourselves. Uh, what did Philadelphia have special? That the rest of these churches is. I think it's important to understand that because, uh, and I think you guys probably have an answer for that. But can we talk about that a little bit before we go to the next question? Sure, uh, I can take it if you don't want to, Rob. Or uh, anyway, I'll go first. But the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things: says he who is holy, who he who is true, who has the key of David, who opens the and no one shuts and shuts and no one's opens. Uh, I see your works. I see I have set before you an open door. No one can shut. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. All right, so he, he's very happy about that, um, that they have kept his word. They've not denied his name. Uh, he knows that they're being tried by the synagogue of Satan. Uh, and, and he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So, you know, I mean, really the commendation is, hey, you kept my word and you didn't deny my name. And I think that's, you know, the long and the short of it is that they were faithful. They, they didn't compromise in any areas. Now, of course, that word compromise means different things for different people, right? Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people think, well, you're doing this thing or this or that or the other, so you're compromising. But I think it really comes down to a practice. You know, what's really sad is that we in the West, we Christians, as opposed to, say, our, 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 our Jewish brothers, uh, we put all of our emphasis on orthodoxy. Okay, it all comes down to what do you believe? And what you believe is of primary importance. It's paramount. Whereas in, say, Judaism, though they get some things wrong, clearly, but it comes down to orthopractice. What are you actually practicing? What are you doing on a daily basis? And I think that is really the message that, that at least Jesus would have us believe, even the Apostle John, uh, James, right? So Jesus wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, right? Blessed is he who hears and does those things that he's commanded. So if you're just a hearer and you don't actually do, well, Jesus has a few things to say about that. Think about the, uh, the master and his three servants, uh, one who had ten talents, one who had five, one who had one. Uh, they all were given something. Uh, the one with ten was, was faithful. He took it. He, you know, he invested it. The one with five invested it. The one with one talent, he didn't do anything. What did he do? He, he buried the darn thing. And the, the master, Jesus, was very upset with that servant. He says, you wicked servant. You knew that I 
reap where I do not sow. So what you could have at least done something with the bankers, right? So you know how we act, how we practice our faith is of great significance to Jesus. And so I think that's something that we should be focused on. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was just looking at that uh, that passage on Philadelphia. I'm going to put it up on screen share here. Um, a lot of people will say in verse 10, because uh, of course we all want to think that we're in the Church of Philadelphia right now, uh, that I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. And say, well, well, maybe that's a rapture verse right there. That you're not going to have to deal with this stuff. And uh, first of all, I see nothing in there about a rapture. But there are a number of ways to be kept from something. Uh, just read Psalm 91. Or read the account of the Exodus. The Israelites did have to experience three of the ten plagues. But for the other seven, they were kept safe in the land of Goshen. Noah was kept safe in the ark during the wrath of God destroying the whole world. Lot was kept safe uh, in a small town while Sodom and Gomorrah were being obliterated by fiery hailstones. So there's a number of different ways to be kept safe or to be preserved uh, without involving a rapture event flying up into the sky. But as Doug said, you know, this whole, you know, I, these people have done their part to stay on God's page, to do things his way, to obey him. And that's the only place of safety. Uh, that's the tribulation survival plan <laughs> right there. And uh, Doug was using the analogy of us going out to coffee, and you can give me all the directions on how to get there, uh, what floor of the building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if I don't show up at the right time, using the fourth dimension analogy, well, we're going to miss our appointment. Well, God has given us, he has given us his times that he says he's going to do stuff on, the appointed times, the Moedim, the Shabbat, Sabbath. Those are times where he says, I'm going to meet with you. Um, he's with us, he's all around us all the time, 24-7, right? But there are specific times that he's doing stuff on, that he has laid out a timeline for us so that, yeah, we can go to the place, we can get the map, we can do all that stuff, but we have to be at the right place at the right time, you know, incorporating that fourth dimension right there. So I think this is important for us to understand, and, and I think that's what's being reflected also in the Church of Philadelphia. Is it, do we exhaust that one out, I think? Maybe? Yeah, go ahead with the next question. Sorry, I was uh, okay. trying to monitor the YouTube chat. It's getting a little yeah, wild. There, so. It's getting a little wild over there, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, okay, the next one comes from Melissa. Uh, she says, I guess this is for Rob. It says, Genesis 1.16. Genesis 1.16 says that the stars were made on the fourth day. So if stars are angels, do you believe these angels were specifically made on the fourth day, but other angels created on another time? Well, when when I look at the stars as angels argument, there is a class of angels known as the heavenly luminaries. There are other classes. There are classes of the watchers. There are classes of the cherubim, the seraphim, um, warrior angels. Um, some might even suggest guardian angels. So, you know, does that mean that every, you know, assuming that angels and are stars and stars are angels, that it would certainly be that class of angel? the um, class of the heavenly luminaries. But when you read, and I forget what chapter it is in Job, maybe 37 or 38, when it talks about the morning stars sang at creation, um, well, creation's still taking place here. So, and you know, when you start getting to man two days later, you know, was that what they were singing about? And is that when all the angels were created? You know, I don't know. I, I certainly see a, a strong connection between angels, perhaps of all classes, and stars. But if I was to really, you know, narrow it down, I would say it's a class of angels, you know. And at this point, I'd have to speculate, you know, if if there were other angels created apart from those angels, I don't see it in the Genesis one account. Um, and it's interesting that in the Genesis one sixteen account regarding the stars, especially if the stars are, you know, what we are 
taught in modern cosmology to believe that they are, you know, potential suns with planets and you know galaxies and all that stuff. It's interesting that he, we get all of a uh, half a sentence, you know, and he made the stars also. Uh, for such a magnitude of creation to be summed up in one tiny little phrase like that, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think that this may be when this, the angel, all the angels were created. I don't really see a problem with that. Um, but if there is a problem, then I would say, okay, then it's this particular class of angels called the heavenly luminaries. Maybe we just have a class of stars. That would solve our whole problem, Rob. <laughs> so, you know, in Jeremiah 31, 35, uh, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Right? So if the heaven above can be measured, that's interesting, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done says the Lord. So, you know, based on this, it sure sounds like we have at least a different class of stars. Maybe some stars we can we can label as, you know, angelic beings, but not all of the stars. I kind of like that uh, class thing there, Rob. It kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, so if we go to uh, Psalm 148, here again we have praise him all as angels, praise him all as hosts. So, so there we see this parallel between angels and hosts, right? And then he says, praise him, sun, moon, and all you stars of light, and then you heavens of heavens and the waters above the heavens. So, you know, um, these are, he says that he established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. So, you know, from what I'm getting from this is that we have, you know, real things up there. We have uh, galaxies, and we have nebula, and we have uh, Alpha Centauri and all these different stars that really do exist. They're not all angels. Uh, so anyway, that's my two cents on that. I know it's your question there, Rob, but uh, I just thought I'd follow up. So all right, what's our next question there, John? All right, well, our next question comes from, uh, so where is it at, John? Is it Sam? Is that the right one? You go ahead and ask it if you know where we're at, because yeah, I do not yeah. know where we're at. <laughs> you, I'm telling you what, you guys are causing a lot of discussion on both chat rooms, and they're having a lot of fun with it, and I want you both to know they're having fun with it. Uh, this one comes from Samuel. He said this one's speculative. Uh, he says he knows it's speculative, but do either Rob or Doug believe that these seven angels are the same seven angels used in tribulation and outpouring of wrath? Namely, is there any evidence they know of for this? Hmm. I, I can't think of any evidence. I don't know if you can, Rob. But no, I can't. But that's an interesting idea, yeah. because you know, uh, and I and I hadn't really. In fact, I didn't really catch it when you were trying to discuss this in the episode, Doug. But when you described it a few minutes ago about heavenly email, um, that's an interesting idea. Uh, you know, he's been transported in a vision from Patmos to this heavenly realm, and you know, we we both believe he's seeing the heavenly control room with all the monitors. He's like, whoa, look at all this stuff, and he's trying to convey it, and it, and it's like, okay, hand it off to these angels, and then the angels will then hand it out to to the the human pastors or messengers or people of whatever capacity they're serving in on earth. Yeah, that's speculative also. It's an interesting idea, though, and to extend that idea that these same angels would be the ones that are going to actually carry out the judgment that is incorporated in those letters, it is speculative, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah, we can't argue against it. We just we don't know if it's true. So it's it's an interesting question. Thank you, Samuel. Yeah. Um, what's what's the next one here, John? All right, this one comes from Rush, and and they're getting more technical as we go. Uh, Rush asks uh, Rob and Doug, do you believe that the planets transitioning each other, Jupiter behind in in front, Venus having anything to do with the star of Bethlehem. Like maybe the planets are the seven angels marching that give signals by their positions in the sky in relation to the constellations. See Genesis 49, 10, Revelations 12. Yeah, there's a software called Stellarium that you can download for free. At, I believe it's stellarium.org, I think is the website. And um, I had heard a teaching that uh, Dr. Michael Heiser gave on Revelation 12 about the same time I was looking into the same information and he was pointing out what was what was going on with 
how the alignment started to take place. And I believe there's another movie uh, documentary called The Star of Bethlehem that kind of yeah. also. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw these after actually getting the software and downloading it. And when, when the date was nailed down for me as September 11th, 3 BC, of course, that, nat that date naturally caught my attention, uh, you know, September 11th. Uh, 3 BC, but the software reckons it as uh, negative 2 because the whole no year 0 and blah blah blah. Uh, so it, 3 BC is reckoned as negative negative 2. So when I downloaded the software and the software allows you to pick your location uh, where the observer is when you're looking in, into the sky field there. So I set my location for ancient Babylon because I believe that, that the Magi were actually of the school of Daniel. Uh, that, that were there and had the prophecies of Daniel and they were looking and the timing was right and then they looked up and saw some things happen. The ancient astro astrologers uh, and astronomers were looking up there and if you actually back the software up to, I think it was um, uh, August uh, 28th, I believe, is where the dance of the stars sort really starts to take place. And it's really quite fascinating to look at in the software. And, and you can actually step the time frame forward, de -de 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 -de, and you see you know, Jupiter parks itself. Uh, Jupiter is the king planet, parks itself uh, over the king star Regulus and the king constellation of Leo. So you got you know three kings right there, boom, boom, boom. And uh, Venus comes in. And I don't remember exactly the order of things. It's been a while since I looked at it. But and, and Mercury, Mercury is the in the mythology is the messenger of the gods. So you you've got this real interesting thing where Venus goes across the king, and and Mercury comes out, and then they kind of go and settle in the in the body of Virgo. Uh, and then by the time you get to September uh, 11th, the sun is in her belly, and it's a new moon at her feet. And I used to be a conjunction guy when it comes to the calendar. Uh, a lot of people in the so-called Hebrew roots movement and whatnot, trying to figure out when the feasts start and you know when the month starts and all that. There's a lot of people who believe conjunction. I was one of them for a long time, till a guy sat in our Torah study group that this has been his one obsession for over 20 years. This is all the guys ever studied. He had like volumes of stuff printed out and all these stuff and ancient history and biblical stuff and 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 I went toe to toe with this guy for three hours. Yeah, but what about this? What about this? What about this? And he knocked down every argument I had with Scripture. And, man, I respect that. I, you know, I'm pretty dogmatic in my beliefs. I, I think my beliefs are well-informed. But if you can give me better, uh, a better understanding and do so with Scripture, well, fine. I'll change my beliefs. I've done that many times before. And he was one that, that got me to change my belief from conjunction to crescent, um, which was sort of a relief because even when I was a conjunction guy and I was looking at the September 11th birthday in Stellarium, it was a crescent moon. It was a crescent, quote unquote, new moon at her feet, and so I always kind of had that that conflict in my mind because I was, uh, you know, I believe that Yeshua was born on September 11th and, and during the Feast of Trumpets. I know some people make a case for uh, tabernacles and all that. Uh, there are problems with that, but regardless, when when they see that dance of the stars take place and everything lines up exactly to Revelation 12, it takes place on September 11th, uh, a 3 BC. So if people are interested in seeing it for themselves, I'll just say go download that software. Go ahead and back it off to about August. Set, for, set your location in Babylon and set your time to negative 2 on the calendar and to August 28th and then step forward to uh, September 11th and you can see that final alignment. But that doesn't really answer the question of what the Magi actually followed. They would have been able to observe that for you know maybe a day or two and as... Um, uh, Dr. Heiser says it, it, the actual alignment was for 80 minutes, which if the thesis is true that that was when he was born, I believe that Mary may have been in labor for those 80 minutes in human history. Uh, but then it, you know, the, the stars and the moon and everything starts moving and going away from that sign. So I don't, in my mind, it doesn't answer the Bethlehem star question, but it does uh, answer what the Magi saw that caused them to go, okay, hey, let's go. You know, something's going on here. The timeline's right. You know, I believe the king is born. Yeah, and I'm. I would just, you know, echo that. I mean, I think you explained it very well, Rob. Um, and I'm, I'm completely, completely open to that. You know, I don't think it has to be an angel move around the sky. I think it could be uh, this, this uh, formation of the planets. So, you know, if it could be, we'll <laughs> let's have to wait and see. All right. Hey, guys, in the chat room, uh, they answered the uh, the cremation, uh, I believe, question, whether you're buried or cremated. I think it was in episode one or two you guys discussed that. So if you go back and watch those videos, uh, you'll, you'll get the answer uh, on that one. Uh, it's becoming a topic. So we're going to go on to Diane. 
Could it be that John is seeing the fall of Satan, the tail of the serpent took one-third of the angels, and when Yeshua said, I saw Satan fall like lightning? So the question again was, uh, uh, John seeing the fall of Satan is the same thing that Jesus saw? Is that? I guess that's how she's trying to ask it. Is it the same thing? Okay. Well, I you know I guess you know the question is when did when did Jesus see Satan fall right? So one possibility is that Jesus saw Satan fall, but because Jesus is outside of time, and he happened to see the you know he happened to give the vision to John, then obviously Jesus would have seen this, though it may not have yet happened. If un or I mean, that's one possibility, uh, or Satan uh, has already you know, fall into the earth. Um, you know, yeah, I think I think they could be the same thing. I, I think that's very possible that uh, that when Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning, um, you know, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard for me to say exactly because the way I see it, I go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. I think there that, you know, definitely happened uh, the first couple of days of creation. I'd say after the first, you know, the first seven days, but in any event, you know, he was all good, he was up with God, and then when he fell, when he morally fell, let's say, then he was then cast down at that point, and then his fall happened very, very quickly, whereas what I see in Revelation chapter 12 is something that is still yet future, because there is going to be a war with Michael in the heavens, you know, and he is going to be cast down to the earth plane, the earth dimension. Um, you know, we know that he's out and about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but we don't see Satan going around like some dragon or some lion, right? We don't actually see him, as far as I can tell, unless you think it's your, you know, your least favorite politician. But, um, you know... But, uh, you know, he is out there, but we can't see him. He's invisible to us. And what I think is going to happen is that in Revelation chapter 12, he, the, the fight he has with Michael is going to be where he is literally pushed through that veil, and he's going to then, you know, come plummeting down to earth. I also pair that up with Revelation chapter 8, which where John sees a great star falling like a torch from heaven, I think that's the same event, and I believe that that is yet future. I don't think that that has happened. Uh, so whatever Jesus saw may have looked similar from his eye, or, as she is suggesting in her question, it could be that he's simply seeing something, describing it as a past tense event, yet it's still a future. From our perspective, it's still yet future. So I don't know. That's That would be my take on that question. I, this one's always really perplexed me. I'm going to put the screen share back up here again. That that reference that she's talking about is in Luke chapter 10, and uh, it says he appointed the Lord appointed 70, and he sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place. And you know he's like, hey, the harvest is plentiful. You know, get out there and heal the sick, cast out demons, and all that stuff. And th they go do that their thing, and then it says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And that's when he says, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And then he talks about giving them power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all that. So the timing of that discussion is rather interesting, and I, I, I honestly don't know what to make of it. I mean, did something happen as a result of those 70 going out and doing their thing? Uh, other people say that Satan fell uh, you know, some kind of pre-edemic scenario, and that the you know the angels had some sort of life here doing their thing, and then there was this big revolt, and something happened, and I I don't I don't subscribe to that idea. Um, so I believe that there was a moral failure, a, a falling in that sense, that took place somewhere within or shortly thereafter the uh, seven-day creation event. Um, but we see in Job that he still has access to heaven. You know, he, he's going out there and then presenting, people are presenting their case there, you know, and, and you got the whole dialogue between Satan and the Lord saying, hey, you know, have you, you consider my servant Job, and, you know, he, he does that, and we also read that Satan goes about as a roaring 
lion uh, seeking whom he may devour and we, we talk about the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places and you know he's the accuser of the brethren so you know he still apparently has access to heaven and I, I agree with Doug that Revelation 12 is a yet to happen it's a future event and that's where I see him truly being kicked out of heaven so how do I reconcile that with Luke chapter 10 I don't know. Uh, you know, if it's it's a, maybe it's a scenario where we read in John chapter one that Yeshua was in the beginning with God, and you know he he was God, and you know he was there at, at the beginning. So if heaven, you know, we keep using this analogy. I don't really believe it's actually like this, but in our human way of thinking, if heaven does have a way of viewing time as a whole on multiple screens, you know maybe Yeshua is just giving a prophetic utterance there, saying, "Yeah, you're right." In the power of my name, this is the ultimate destination of Satan. And, you know, parenthetically, I might suggest that, yeah, while I was in heaven, outside of time dimension, of, of Earth's time dimension, I saw the monitor where, you know, he finally gets booted out of heaven. But best I could tell, the, the event of him literally being kicked out of heaven and falling to Earth is yet to happen. It's a Revelation 12 Michael War in Heaven event that, that we're still waiting on. All right, moving right along. Now, the next question. Now, I've seen two mentions of two planets, and this comes from Brent. Uh, why are the planets not mentioned in the Bible, especially Genesis? And I, I, th I believe I've read uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Have been have they been mentioned? Uh, I'm trying to think back on it. God, okay. not, not as planets. You know, King James uses the word planets in first or second kings. I forget which, but... Actually, the word that's used there, and Doug can either confirm or deny this, uh, is uh, Mazaloth, which in every other translation and every other usage is constellations, uh, or what we might today refer to as the zodiac. So I see no legitimate reference to planets as planets. Um, you have the reference in Jude where you have these wandering stars, which the planets would certainly fit that description. But the actual uh, understanding of planets that we have today, I don't, I don't really see it in Scripture. Yeah, and in fact, wandering stars is the Greek word planetos, which just is a, it's a wandering something up there. So we attach the word star to it. Uh, it it's not required at all from the Greek, but you know, simply to give us a, a better context of what that's all about then yeah, uh, it's, it's rendered as wandering stars. But if you, again, take a look at that in the Greek, you can look at it in Jude 13, and uh, the Greek word there is, uh, well, you know what, I've got to eat my own words here. I <laughs> take that back. So it's asteres uh, planetes. Oh, okay, I was wrong. Um, it, so it is, you know, it's stars wandering, okay? So there you have it. I mean, uh, but, it, of course, it's talking about um, these people that are uh, spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you, they're only serving themselves. Uh, they are wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So I'm not sure what else to make of that other than <laughs> there you have the, the reference there to these wandering stars. But... Uh, yeah, but the word planetos just means a wandering thing, so it can be used in a, many contexts, yeah, uh, not just not just stars. But yeah, the context there in Jude are people causing problems. Yeah, exactly. There are yeah. wanderers who you know come in and, and cause you know difficulties and stuff. And here here it is on um, Bible.cc, uh, planetes, a wanderer talks about a false teacher operating without moral compass, exploiting uh, other aimless people. It's interesting that the origin of it is uh, Plano. Uh, like Plano, Texas? Is there yeah, a no. correlation there? So, <laughs> I, I, like I, people in Plano are just kind of like I've been, wandering or something? I've been or? wondering that myself because Plano is a far <laughs> away from where I live. Uh, <laughs> this is a pl Planao, I guess is how you pronounce it, but uh, which basically means to deceive, deviate, or lead astray. So, you know, the, you know, the planets that we call planets today, from our perspective down here, looking at them, they certainly do look like stars wandering around. But going back to the original question, I see no uh, biblical reference to planets the way we understand them. And when you see, like, uh, Jupiter, 
Um, you know, they they thought uh, was it uh, Barnabas was uh, I think it was Barnabas was Jupiter and Paul was uh, Mercury. Uh, that th those are deities. You know, the planets were certainly named after these deities, but in the context of the conversation, they that's where you find those words Jupiter um, and whatnot. Although it is interesting when it's talking about the um, Diana of the Ephesians and um, See if I can pull that up, uh, because that's in what Acts or Zeus? Uh, yeah, Acts uh, uh, fourteen thirteen maybe. Priest of no, someone I can't find it off 14, top. Fourteen twelve at Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes. No, that's what a, I'm, 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 I'm. I think it's nineteen actually. Acts nineteen thirty five. Yeah, reference. And, yeah, uh, the men of Ephesus, what man is there does not know the city of Ephes Ephes Ephesians, his temple guarded of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus. Yeah, now that's a really interesting, I'm going to put that one up here. I just, thank you. Uh, Acts 19.35. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I'm an advocate for parallel Bibles, because you find interesting things like this. Okay, you look in King James, and it says the image which fell down from Jupiter. But all these other guys have sky and heaven and you know that's uh, pretty much everybody else is using a, a totally different idea here uh, the American what is this one here New Heart English never even heard of that one it says Zeus uh, Jubilee Bible Jupiter uh, American King James of course so it's bizarre here because that's not the word for Jupiter I don't believe um, timekeeper art from the sky here's the word right here so that's the the apotes or something like that, fallen from the sky. Now, origin of the word says from Dios of Zeus, and the same as pipto. What's pipto? Pipto means to fall. To fall. Yeah. yeah so you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know enough to about Greek to understand why you know some chose to say that this image fell from Jupiter. You know, obviously a stellar. Uh, um, because they, the idea is falling from the sky, when you know the majority of people are just translating that as sky or heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is it is very curious, like why, um, why they would do that. <laughs> I'm not really sure myself, so I'll have to look into that. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, the word Di uh, Diana is Artemis in the in the the Greek there. But um, and from uh, Dio Petus, so I don't know. That's interesting. But if you have Pipto is to fall, so I don't know. That's a good question. But uh, all right. Well, let's move on to the next question. All right. I think John wants me to ask this one because I've been kind of silent here. We got Garage. His name's Garage Doors. Uh, Rob and Doug. Where in the scriptures exactly does it speak about the millennial reign of Christ, or is this just a calculated idea or belief? This is off subject, but nonetheless, a pretty good question. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there there's a lot of scriptures that talk about that. There's no specific reference to the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, you know, that is something that we have coined as as a phrase to discuss that. But I would probably begin the journey in Matthew 25 when Jesus uh, talks about how when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So, you know, that's when it starts, is when Jesus comes, he's going to set up his throne. You could then also look in Daniel chapter 7, because in Daniel chapter 7, we see that there's going to be this one like the Son of Man, uh, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His Dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. All right, so that's another important reference to this kingdom that Jesus is going to set up. 
And of course, there are many more. We could then also go to Isaiah chapter 11, where speaking again about the Messiah, that he's going to come, he's going to, um, you know, his delight will be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge with his eyes or see inside by, uh, by hearing of his ears, but he will judge in righteousness. Okay, so this is talking about the Messianic kingdom. Uh, how do we know that? Well, first of all, when he comes, he's going to, with the breath of his lips, he's going to slay the wicked. So that's the second coming. Uh, you can cross-reference that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth, rendering him powerless by the manifestation of his coming. And then we also see that the, the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb, the leopard is going to lie down with the young goat, etc., so, you know, this is all a future time. If you think this is happening now, not you personally, garage doors, but some people do. And I'm like, well, then go put your kid next to the lion's den. Let's just see what happens. So I, I would argue this is a time that's yet coming. So these are some of the, the classic uh, times. Now, the only place that we get the thousand years actually spelled out for us, which is spelled out many times, is in Revelation chapter 20. So in during that time, Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years, okay, and then he's going to come out after the thousand years are finished. So there we have it again. So that's two times. So six times it's mentioned here that it's going to be a thousand years, all right. And so here's the next one: a thousand years. They lived with, reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So that's probably your most uh, specific of the reign of Christ. If you're going to reign with Christ, then he's obviously reigning, and it's a thousand years, so we just we, we call that term the thousand year reign of Christ. Uh, but, you know, that's probably your best verse as far as you know, getting those exact keywords uh, in one, uh, one verse is probably going to be right there in Revelation 20 verse 4. All right. Um, so let's go on to the next question here. Do, or Rob, did you have anything to add to that, or are you you pretty much on board? With that? Exactly what I would say. So. Okay. Good deal. That's okay. Right. So let's go ahead and go to Sam's question. Sam's got a pretty interesting question. Enoch mentioned that the stars were on their intended planes. Is it possible that the seven planets are 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 where the fallen angels are imprisoned until their time comes? Well, I, I don't think you can derive that from the Book of Enoch, uh, because it, it says that they are buried under the sands of the earth, um, and that they are in Tartarus, which is in the earth. So, uh, I, I mean, some are underneath, underneath Euphrates and all that. So. Yeah, well, we do read about four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates for a very specific time to be released. Uh, so, I mean, I know there are other people out there talking about prison planets and stuff like that, and it's interesting, you know, sci-fi speculation, but uh, you can't get that from the Book of Enoch. I have nothing to add to that. Uh, you know, I, I just don't have anything to add, so, yeah, right. interesting question, though. Okay, uh, the Vigilant Texan says, uh, do they think that our timekeeping system and calendar are part of the beast system? that are already in place, or will that change when Antichrist takes control? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, yeah. And this comes up a lot in, in sort of the Torah-keeping circles right now because everybody's still trying to get on the... I mean, they're doing the best they can with the information we have to try to get on God's calendar. You know, we talked about the importance of the Moedim, the appointed times. Well, okay, how do we account the how do, how do we reckon those times? And you know, when is the Shabbat? I personally believe we're in the Shabbat right now. I believe the Shabbat started at sunset on Friday and it will go till sunset on Saturday. There are other people that argue and say, no, it's a lunar Sabbath. It's based on the lunar. You know, and they well, how do you know that? Well, you know, when, how do you calculate the moon? Is it the full moon? Is it the new moon crescent or conjunction? And and, and then when you have to deal with that in light of the Gregorian calendar that we have right now, which replaced the Julian calendar, which replaced other calendars, I think, honestly, I think it's a pipe dream to, to suggest that any of us have any of, uh, have any calendar absolutely correct right now. And I don't know that we will until the two witnesses show up. I think right now we have been 2,730 plus years in exile, and now we're all kind of waking up out of our judgment 
and, and I call it the Ephraim Awakening, and we're doing the best we can with the information we have and the calendars that we're currently using. But these calendars got messed up a long time ago. So when all this hype about the Shemitah was, you know, going around, you know, recently, I'm like, how in the world can anybody say that we have kept a, a seven-year cycle consistently since the Shemitah was first introduced in the Torah? Uh, that's impossible. With all the changes and things that have happened, and most of the books and stuff that were out there promoting the Shemitah thing were very much Amero-centric. You know, with 9/11 and the stock market cl cl crash of 2008 and everything. Well, you know, uh, sorry, the, the, the I was skeptical about that whole thing when, while it was happening. Uh, so, uh, to suggest that we have any idea right now what what the calendar is and how, the, which one's correct, I, I think there's no way that we could do that. And one of the reasons for the two witnesses is because the scripture says it takes two witnesses to establish truth. So I believe part of the, their ministry here is going to be to get everybody on, in sync. You know, right now we are a bunch of toddlers out here presenting dad with some scribbles and crayon on paper saying, hey, are we doing it right? And he's like, you know what, good job, Rob, good job, Doug, John, whatever. You know, and he puts it up on the heavenly refrigerator. And, and over time, as we continue to dig and as we continue to research, then maybe we'll learn more and our drawings will get a little better, you know, but... Right now, I, I don't. Anybody who says they have the perfect calendar, I would be very suspicious of them. Yeah, and, and I think uh, that it it may not be so much about an actual, you know, calendar from month to month, but I I would suggest that the times that we're we're speaking of uh, is a reference probably back to Daniel, where you know he's going to intend to change the times and the law. Um, so you know that's what I would see uh, the, as far as the calendar. I don't think you know whether we say January, February. I, I don't think there's a problem with that. I think it, as Rob was definitely speaking here, is that it has to do with the times that God established, and this is why I think it's so important that we you know at least acknowledge, hey, it's Passover, you know, or it's uh, Shavuot or something. You know, it doesn't be like a gigantic party, but you know, these are the times that God has established, and of course, what is the Antichrist going to do, or the Antichrist spirit going to do? That 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 uh, mystery of lawlessness that was already present that Paul said. What what's it going to do? It's going to intend to change the times that God has established, so that we will forget. We will not keep doing what He has told us to do. You know, it's kind of like uh, the ultimate horror movie where you know you somebody could be saved but then you know maybe this kind of goes back to some of the you know the, the kids tales right where we have fairy tales and and if you could just get there at the right time but then you took a bite of that poisonous apple and now you're going to miss the time of the banquet or of the the ball where the prince is going to pick his princess and you can't be there cuz you you ran out of time and i think that's essentially what the antichrist or the antichrist spirit has been working on, and you know what I've really come to see is that when the Bible t speaks about a lot of things, it's rarely a a a, uh, a nanosecond kind of event. It, usually, these things are drawn out over years, if not centuries, or even millennia. And so, I think the spirit of Antichrist that Paul warned us about, that John warned us about, that it was already beginning. You know, as soon as Jesus went up. Uh, this thing starts to set in. You know, we see this with the slander of Paul. Uh, we see this when they got rid of keeping the Sabbath. They got rid of keeping these feasts, and then they outlawed them and said that it's illegal to do these things. I think that is the dissolution of God's calendar uh, in favor of some other one. So again, I don't. I don't think it's specifically that you know we have you know 12 months and. All this different stuff, but it's 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 those specific dates, those specific feasts that God has intended for us to keep. And I think you know Constantine did a bang up job when he got rid of not just Constantine, but others got rid of the Sabbath. And you know that's a great way to make us forget, uh, you know, God's calendar. So that's what I would suggest that God's calendar is is, is the specific things, essentially the Sabbath. And then the feast. That's really what God's calendar is all about. Uh, so that's how I see it. 
Very good. Um, I, we got several. How many more questions do you guys want to answer? I know it's getting it's 11.35 Central now, so 12.35 Eastern. I can take a few more. Okay. Uh, I'll just go ahead and go through them, and when you guys are ready to stop, we will stop. Okay. Um, the next one here um, from Sean, it says, Could it be possible that Lucifer is just doing his job with God, and he is just playing his part with good and evil? That he is just there to test us and just playing his part. Mm -hmm. That's a Gnostic <laughs> belief. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but I see that he ends up in the lake of fire. So it, I don't think he's just playing a part. I think he's a rebellious angel that, you know, through pride and whatnot, wanted to take over. And he's doing his best to try to hurt God the only way he can because he's an inferior being, so he can't take God, God directly. So what better way to hurt somebody than to go after their kids? And, you know, God's not happy about that, and he's going to pay a big price for it in the end. So that would be my take on it. Yeah, my position on Lucifer is that he is literally offended by God because God's whole economy is that the greater will serve the lesser. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Satan, as the highest of God's created order, was therefore expected to be the greatest of all, all servants. And the person that or people that he was supposed to serve were specifically Adam and Eve. That's why it says in Hebrews that are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to those who receive eternal life or salvation? So uh, and it's interesting that Adam and Eve were not granted eternal life at the very beginning, right? They were, they were, um, they were innocent. They were not in a state of death, but neither did they had, neither had they taken of the tree of life so that they would live forever. And so I believe that the angels' role was to be ministering spirits. And as the the the, the head honcho, he was supposed to be head servant, right? That's really what his role was. And I think he was really happy with serving God because God is pretty darn impressive. But tell me to serve this guy made of dirt, and I'm offended. And you know, I think that's what his his thing was. And so he, I believe that he feels very, very justified in what he's doing. He's not just you know upset and I don't like God because you know I could do better. I don't I don't think that was his 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 scheme. I think it was. How could God possibly expect me to serve somebody made of dirt? I mean, I am the greatest of all the angels, and he should be serving me, you know? So I think he he's, feels justified in that sense. And so, you know, he's kind of a freedom fighter. He is, you know, one of the, the rebel alliance, right? He's like, we're going to take down this, this empire because it's evil, right? And so I think that's how Satan actually sees it. Um, but, you know, th that's the amazing thing about love is that love is about serving other people and it's not about dictating your own way and getting you know lording it over people that that's what Satan does that's what his kingdom is all about but that's not God's kingdom God's kingdom is about being of service and so in the end I think you know obviously Satan's gonna get what we read about in scripture he will end up in the lake of fire so I think uh, you know I definitely agree with Rob here that he's not just some little pawn that God created you know, just to be the, uh, for, for example, the, the Jews talk about Yetzer Hara and uh, Yetzer Tov. So you have the good inclination, Yetzer Tov, and then you have Yetzer Hara, which is the evil inclination, and that Satan is nothing more than some, some abstraction, some ex abstract idea. I don't believe that. I believe that he is a, a living, uh, conscious entity and that he has a vendetta against God because he feels that he's been slighted and you know it's unjust, etc. And so, and I think we can read about that in three key places, which would be Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and Genesis chapter 3. I think that all three of those are one and the same event, uh, within maybe you know a day or two or something. But this idea when he was cast down to the earth. They're all the same event of him being cast down there in the garden to the dirt. And so I would, I would put those together. I actually did do a video called um, The Angelic Domain and the Fall of Satan. If you want to check that out on YouTube, uh, it is up there. 
it's also in my store if you want to check that out as well. But uh, and I have a paper on that is on my my website as well. It's called the Angelic Domain of the Fall of Satan. So you can you can read it or watch it either way. But yeah, Satan is a real being with uh, real emotions, real plans. And they're very sinister, and he eventually he will end up in the lake of fire. All right. Um, well, well, I guess the, the, this next question, it's, uh, I'm skipping one because this kind of goes along with it, and it was a question I was going to ask you guys as well um, because I think it brings an interesting topic, and it would you know, be good for the audience to hear this because there's so many theories about this going around. Has Satan fallen yet, literally fallen yet? And um, also the second part to this question is going to be uh, in Chapter 12, does it start over from the beginning with the fall of Satan, or is there a second fall? Hmm. I think I already answered that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean he he's fallen morally, right? He's he's a, he's apostate, uh, but he still has access to the other dimension. Do you believe and, he's in his fallen state now? Because I mean, obviously, in his fallen state, how is he going to ascend to the heavens and stand before the throne of God? That's I think that's the, you know, there's a there's obviously there's a thing going around where no people think that he has not fallen yet, but he, he's definitely. Uh, transgressed or so, or you know, transgressed, but he hasn't actually fallen, as in Revelation 12, you know, states. I, I think Revelation 15:8 kind of gives us the answer. It says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Um, you know, I, what I see there is that basically God is in this temple structure in the heavenly realm. And, uh, you know, maybe it's made of clear glass or crystal. That would seem to be the case, uh, perhaps. But in any, 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 any sense of the, the, the idea here is that, uh, you know, he's kind of in a, an enclosed container. And it seems like he, only he can be in there until everything is resolved, until heaven and earth are restored. And, uh, because, you know, the blood of Jesus did what was necessary, but, it, you know, he hasn't hit the go button yet. So what I would suggest is that Satan has access to the city. He can get in proximity to God, but can he get right up next to God? Uh, that is something we don't know. I can only speculate, of course, but I would suggest that no, he can't get right up in God's face, uh, but he can obviously you know, get close enough, whatever that means, to be able to, to kind of you know, hover and maybe have a conversation with God, what we see from Job. But as far as being directly in front of God, and you know, and the word in God's presence literally means in front of His face, before His face. Okay, so the question then is, can He be before God's face? Nobody can see God's face and live on the mortal level. What about Satan? I would suggest that when God caused the fire to come out from within Him, that he 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 lost that connectivity to God, and now it is actually painful to be in God's presence. So he can he can only come to be near God uh, uh, from a certain distance. But I will add to that that it also says that God is surrounded in thick darkness. All right. So I think the thick darkness is actually a protective layer that God is kind of wearing until until the restoration of all things, and then that that thick darkness is going to dissipate completely. Uh, we see that thick darkness also spelled out in Isaiah chapter 6 uh, when he uh, is you know, transported in a vision into the heavenly realm and it says that um, you know, the Lord, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, it's high and lifted up and then it says um, that there was smoke uh, there in, in that area. So you know, again, that's uh, he says, and uh, and the house was filled with smoke, right? So Isaiah is seeing this through a vision, uh, but what would it actually be for Satan to actually be there? Well, God's in this house filled with smoke, right? We see that in many places, as Revelation 15:8, as I mentioned earlier, that there's this, uh, you know, the the glory, and then there's this smoke in there, and then when 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 it's actually opened then this smoke is going to come out of, uh, of his throne. So I hope I'm, I'm kind of answering the question here. I'm trying to you know, pull a lot of different scriptures together that suggest 
that yes, Satan can have a general access, but not maybe a specific access. Okay, so basically you're saying he's already fallen. That's that he's not going to fall again. So when Revelation 12 says states about this fall that happens, this is a historical statement. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he has fallen morally, but he still has access to that spiritual realm. Whereas in Revelation 12, he's going to kind of be pushed through the veil, if you will, and uh, so that you know, because he and Michael can exist on the same plane. All right, and after that battle. Michael will remain in that plane. We'll still have access to that plane, and Satan will no, no longer have access. His his key card will be taken away. Essentially, you know, he'll be <laughs> denied access uh, to to that part of of the cosmos, right? So, whatever that means. Okay, that answers it. Uh, that answers the question for sure. Uh, let's go to the next question. We have Sean. Um, and I think this is a quick and easy answer for you guys. Is Ra or um, is Satan Semyaza in the Book of Enoch? No. Um, well, it's not in my opinion. No, I don't believe. I, you know, I know some people think that, but I, I, I don't see that at all. Uh, he seems to be a leader. He was a leader of the 200 watchers that that came down on Mount Hermon, according to the Book of Enoch. But that would mean if he if Satan was the same as Samjaza, then that would mean that Satan's locked up in Tartarus. Mm -hmm. That that's not true. So, yeah. I, I agree with that. I don't think Satan is Samjaza. Um, so, yeah, he, unless if, if he's running around seeking who may devour, it's kind of hard to do in chains. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> but okay, so we'll go to the next question. Um, to follow up, I used Stellarium too. Do you know the Revelation 12 sign happens again September 17 or 2017 with Jupiter, the crescent moon, and everything? Yeah, I've heard the claims. I've used it and looked at it. It's not even remotely close to what we see on September 11, 3 BC. It is similar. I mean, and and apparently that uh, a, more or less that alignment happens fairly frequently, but not to the precision that it did on September 11th, 3 BC. So I've seen the arguments and people, I mean, if you go check it out for yourself, it's not nearly as compelling as the September 11th, 3 BC alignment, although it is sort of close. All right, Doug, anything to add to that? No, okay. nothing at all. <laughs> all right, all right. so uh, Alishiba, Alish Sheba, uh, and I always pronounce her name wrong. Alishiba, Alish Abiya. Yashra'el, Yashra'al. That's an interesting name. Yeah, yeah, interesting name. Okay, um, can you ask, is it possible that the reason the demons are working with the governments of the earth to create these technologies like the LHC is because they need us? They need human physical bodies to build what they need in order to re-enter our realm, like a quid pro quo thing. That's what uh, David Jacobs suggests. Is that um, uh, and uh, what's the other guy? David, um, who was from Harvard. I'm forgetting his name, but um, anyway, they both suggest that um, wasn't Mark something. Anyway, they both suggest or I don't know John. John was it John? John. There we go. <laughs> it's one of these guys, right? Anyway, David Jacobs. I remember his name. So you know, he suggests. Uh, in his research, he's been studying the UFO alien abduction phenomenon for about 35 years, and you know he was all happy about it, excited, and this is the dawn of a new age. And then one day, it just kind of dawned on him that, <laughs> wait a second, we're in big trouble because all of these experiments that they claim to be doing uh, is not to improve humanity; it's to you know bring some kind of a fusion between these two different races because they are disembodied that's and again David Jacobs is a, a researcher he's not a Christian he doesn't as far as I know he doesn't really uh, put too much credence in the Bible as far as I can tell um, you know so his his worldview is basically evolutionary atheist right and you know he's kind of excited about these otherworldly beings he was until he put two and two together that no they're using us they're trying to create a hybrid race 
so that uh, we can um, all put it back together uh, so they can have some kind of a embodiment and John Mack is the other guy I was thinking of from Harvard so and they both came to these same conclusions after having these hypnotic regressions with hundreds of people uh, that did not know each other they had no relationship with one another and they all gave a very similar report of this experience that they had of being abducted as they claimed and that they had uh, seed or an egg taken from them and then they would create this hybridized being and and the aliens told them that you know this is the future of humanity so that they can basically have a uh, you know some kind of a, a body so you know kind of going back to the whole Nephilim idea what I what I believe is that the one of the reasons that uh, they did that the demons did is because yeah they were disembodied with the, the amazing bodies that God originally gave them became just a, a, a shrunken shell and um, and they lost a lot of freedom they lost a lot of capacity when that happened but they didn't lose their capacity to deceive us to lie and to cause a lot of fear but as far as the actual strength that they have you know I don't they don't have really any that I can tell uh, any any significant strength and so now they want to embody themselves again because then they can they don't have to do things through agents they can do it directly themselves and they can sort of uh, terraform the world as they see fit so that's my perspective on it what about you Rob yeah it would be exactly the same I covered pretty much everything you just said and actually had quotes from David Jacobs in my uh, Mount Herman Mount Herman Roswell DVD it actually shows him discussing what you just said so that would be yeah. exactly my answer yeah and I talked about that in corrupting the image as well so yeah awesome all right, guys, we are out of questions, surprisingly. I think John cut <laughs> off for there for a while, so we, we had a really good – that was a good show, I think. Uh, we covered a lot of a lot of topics, um, not so much um, as many as we, we could have on our Revelation 2, but uh, it was still interesting, to say the least. So, Rob, what is next week? Okay, next week. Uh, I actually won't be available next week, so if you guys wanted to – do the show without me, that's fine. I'm, I'm going to be doing another conference next week, the whole weekend. So, uh, But this particular episode, episode 10, is the next one. We didn't actually, uh, we kind of says right here, uh, we took a break from discussing the book of Revelation to address some of the issues that were brought up in the previous shows, in particular the issue of keeping the commandments, uh, Sabbath and feasts of Yahuwah. What is the significance of these things for the believer? Find out in this episode. So we had been talking so much in the previous episodes about the importance of, of God's Torah and that we were getting a lot of feedback on it. You know, this was early on and certainly in both of our uh, walks. You know, For me, I came into this Torah kind of thing back in 2009. I'm not sure what year Doug did, but uh, in 2013 we were both pretty new to the whole thing ourselves. And quite zealous, and we, I would say, still are. Um, but as a result of that, a lot of our other brothers and sisters who weren't on that same page were coming at us on Facebook and YouTube comments and stuff like that. So it looks like we decided to take a little break and just address some of the issues. So uh, that's what that particular episode was about. How ironic we're going to take a break again. <laughs> right. So. Yeah, I think we'll take a break from that one. It's, I think you guys together need to be together on that one. So maybe fr this is coming Friday, we will postpone it to the Friday after and uh, that sounds good with you Rob everybody else has gave a thumbs up on yeah. that so. okay. sounds good awesome. well okay. we just want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for another episode of quest for truth as usual everybody stay in the word that has all the answers uh, you know don't look to any particular individual but look to God and look to his word and what it says study it live it practice it and uh, and then you'll hear well done good and faithful servant. So thanks, everybody. Until next time. Right, Shabbat yeah. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And Rob, why don't you tell everybody what conference you're going to be at in case they want yeah. to Yeah. Well, this isn't uh, the typical conference that you know I, I'm usually doing. This is a the scripture-based self-help program called The Road Adventure. Uh, this is a, a Road Adventure weekend. And then the week after that, we'll, I'll be available to do a Quest for Truth commentary. And then the week after that, 
there is a conference that people might be interested in. It's going to be taking place in Lubbock. It's uh, a Giants conference. I think it's the fourth annual Giants conference out in Lubbock. I'll be there. Uh, I think Aaron Judkins may be there. I know Judd Burton's going to be there and Joe Taylor. So uh, we can talk about more more about that in uh, another episode. Awesome. Yeah. So everyone, thank you for your questions. They're they're great questions. Uh, and keep them coming, okay? And so we uh, wish you the best, and may God bless you.